Uh, you'll have seen Mike Dean has taken charge of that rather dull game between Leicester and Brighton this evening. But after receiving death threats following uh, the dismissal of Thomas Suchek at the weekend, Dean, at his own request, won't be taking charge of a Premier League game this weekend coming. To discuss, we have Dermot Gallagher with us. 1,200 professional games as a referee. First Division debut age 33 in 1990 and finished up 17 years later in 2007. Was a FIFA referee as well. Took the 96 FA Cup final, United Liverpool and Cantona at uh, Wembley. Dermot, great to have you with us. Thanks for joining us. I know you moved a few things around to join us at this time, so it's appreciated. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, I introduced you as Dermot Gallagher. And uh, this is from years of watching you on English television, but of course I'm talking to <laughs> Rings End's Dermot Gallagher. So am I, should I be saying Ga <laughs> Gallagher? It doesn't matter. I'm still used to it now, Joe, honestly. <laughs> I got called all the names. Um, nobody could pronounce my name right when I came to England, so it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm well worn into it. I can imagine. Did you experience anything like this Mike Dean situation, a death threat, Dermot? I didn't. I was talking earlier in the week um, when I did my um, slot on Sky. I said to uh, Stephen Warnock and Sue Smith, I look back. I, I'm not a great one for looking back, I hasten to say. It's only on when people ask me questions I, I talk about. I don't volunteer information about the past. But I, I look back at when I refereed, and I, I think I was very, very lucky in so much as there wasn't the social media. And I said to both Stephen and Susan that when I refereed, without doubt, the players gave you a bit of stick. You know, now and again, you'd have a manager come to the dressing room afterwards and he was unhappy about a decision. You might even have the misfortune to go out to the car park and a few supporters were waiting half hour, 45 minutes after the game to give you a little bit of stick. But when you drove out of the car park, the minute you hit the main road, it was over. You know, that, that was it, it brought closure. Um, and, you know, I watch all the Premier League games now. I, I, I'm very, very privileged that I've got a studio to go into every Saturday, every Sunday, every match day. And I watch every single game live. And not not one live game. Every single match is being beamed in. And I I watched the game on Saturday and I didn't think it was a red card at the time. I, I don't think it's a red card now and everybody's in agreement with me. But with what's rolled out since, Joe, I'm quite flabbergasted that, you know, a guy goes to work on a Saturday and that's all he's doing. He's going to work. And he's working in an industry that when I was a boy in Rings End growing up, I just wanted to be a footballer. I used to tell my dad I'd play at Lansdowne Road one day and he laughed at me. And, you know, God willing, I did set foot on the pitch one day and referee a game there. But it was a pleasure. You know, when I was a schoolboy, it was a pleasure. When I was a teenager, it was a pleasure. When I came to England, I played football until I was 21 when I was seriously ill and I took up refereeing. And it was a pleasure. And you mentioned about the 1,200 games I did. And it was a pleasure. Now, what's changed that people want to take that pleasure away? Because Mike Dean has gone to work on Saturday, a work that I will tell you is an absolute dream. If you can't play football at the highest level, to go and referee at the highest level is the second best thing. And you have a job that you couldn't have dreamt of when you were a schoolboy. And he made a mistake. That's all he did. All he was guilty of was making a mistake. And I would also hasten to add, Joe, that the mistake was driven by somebody else because if you watch the, the images, you know, Mike Dean's looking at the incident. He seems to deal with it on the field. The two players seem happy to get on. And then suddenly it's triggered by the VAR. And I honestly, Joe, in my heart of hearts, I don't think he should have been sent to that monitor. And I think that's where the damage was done for Mike Dean on Saturday. 2007 was probably a nice time to retire. You were just ahead, out the door ahead of the advent of social media becoming as prevalent as it is now. The issue mm. with social media is it gives everybody a, vo a, a, a voice. And it's easy for me to sit here and for everybody else to assume that the death threat that went Mike Dean's way and the way of his family, we should add as well, it's mm. easy to assume that is just an idiot or a kid who's no more capable of carrying out anything remotely close to what was threatened. However, if I mm. was Mike Dean or if I was in his family, it would cause havoc in my life. And that's the really tricky thing when it comes to social media. I mean, okay, look, please get involved and track this idiot down. But I mean, another idiot next week can set up a third social media account and fire in the same death threat that he, he or she has no intention of carrying out, but it's the havoc that it causes mm. for a referee. 
Well, it's it's not just a referee, and uh, you know, let's not forget. You know, we've seen footballers subject to this in the last few weeks. A yeah. number of footballers have been harassed on social media platforms, and but talking about Mike because that's what you asked me to do. You know, I, I would say, you know, I just can't believe what he he would have been going through on Saturday evening, Sunday morning. I I I can't even describe in words what he must have felt. The one thing I will say is that. The PGMO, you know, who governed the referees at the the top level, Cascade, and right the way down to through the leagues, they have an infrastructure now of support which is second to none. Mm-hmm. You know, and what will happen is Mike will be ring fenced. You know, he'll be monitored daily. He'll be able to speak to people. And the other thing I'd say is, the pool of referees around him will support him as if it happened to them. You know, they they will ring fence Mike, and they will ensure that he's in the right possible frame of mind. And he's obviously a very, very strong person mentally because he's gone out to referee in the FA Cup at Leicester tonight. And I think he was due to do that. So he's fulfilled that. And then what he's going to do, he's going to have, um, it will be 10, 11 days break to just probably gather his thoughts, just let the dust settle and speak to his family, you know, and enjoy them, you know, enjoy the pleasure that they bring him and surround himself with happy things, happy thoughts, to put him back in the great place that he wants to be back out on the football mm. field. Do you know him well? I work with Mike because uh, you have to remember that Mike came on to the, um, the Premier League in the uh, mid to late 90s. Um, I didn't leave until 2007. You know, I was very, very lucky and very privileged. I worked with Mike. He was a brilliant trainer. There's no doubt about that. I prided myself on I was very, very fit and was always out there doing my stuff. Mike would compete with me. What I will say, he's a brilliant person. He's got a a wonderful sense of humour, which people don't appreciate. Um, They don't realise he's got that. He's a very, very great sportsman. I mean, he plays golf off about four or five. He's When we had uh, sports and challenges, you always wanted to be in his team Mm. because he was a great competitor. But he's a genuine guy, and he doesn't deserve this no more than anybody does, Joe. No, it's insane when you stop and think about it, that we're talking about death threats in football. It's really shocking. Like, I'm watching him here on my screen. He's jogging around the pitch, and it's just mad to think what's potentially going through his head. I'm sure it's maybe a bit of a relief for him to get out in a pitch for 90 minutes and forget about it. So there's no doubt, Dermot, that social media has just inflamed everything. What about at matches? I don't know how often you get to a game in person, certainly pre-COVID anyway. You've been uh, there in the heat of it from, say, 1990, first division debut through until... Oh seven. So say, take 20 years ago, around 2000, 2001. How mm. does the abuse coming from the stand, do you think, compare, say, last year before COVID to 2001? It's quite strange because one of the things, um, especially when I used to, you know, before COVID, I used to go home back to Dublin at least once a month, you know, even if it was only for two or three days. I'd, I'd always take that opportunity because, you know, I've got friends, family there, referees who I have worked with and it just allowed me to get back out of England and about out of that but it's it's weird that they they always ask me that same question and I can honestly tell you that in the big games I never heard anything because it was just a cacophony of sound yeah. it just got lost what was the frightening thing and um and when I, I live in a village now a, a village in Oxfordshire and it's a small village they've got a village football team and I go up, you know, if, if say there's a blank weekend and Ireland are playing away and I can't go to the game, you know, say they were in Georgia one time. So I go up to the village to watch. And that's where I see the problem because there's seven, eight people watching. And if one of them lets rip at you a few times during a match, you hear every word, it mm. becomes personal. So I think it's the hardest part, really, when you're refereeing regarding on-field abuse is when you're starting out, you know, you're... You're trying to find your way and there's very, very small crowds and they can get stuck into you. When there's bigger crowds, I mean, imagine being at Lansdowne Road, you know, for an international. No matter what the supporter shouted at the referee, there's very, very little chance he'd ever hear it. Mm. So hard to detect, really, if there's a big difference in a Premier League crowd 10, 20 years ago with now. Well, I wouldn't wouldn't think there is, to be honest. um, um, but I, in many ways, I'd feel that um, 
the chanting from the from the stands now would be less so because it's all seater, mm. so it, it is less tribal, um, and you see more families at football now. You see much more women at football, which is brilliant. Much more children at football. You know, you you actually see, when when we're getting ready for games at three o'clock on a Saturday as we used to, and it's four or five games, and you're scanning around the grounds half hour before. You see the families sat eating their food before games, and you think. Well, this wasn't quite like this when I was a little boy going down to Milltown. You had to be there early because you had to stand on the terraces. You had to get a spot, otherwise somebody would nick it off you. Mm. Um, but now your seat's there. It's, it's, it's a different environment. Yeah, it's a pity that doesn't extend to social media. When did you move to <laughs> England, by the way, Dermot? I went, when I, I went twice, actually. I went when I was eight and a half, November 65, when I had my first house. Uh, my dad got a job on the railway in England. He wanted to move into a house and then um, we had uh, we lost our mammy when I was 13 and I went back to Dean's Grange to my granny's and then uh, I really moved to England full time in uh, July 73 when I was 16 because uh, I had to start work so I got work in England. Wow, different times. What did you start work at at 16? A uh, newspaper printer. It's quite quite ironic. I was on the keyboards. I used to do all the typing for the newspapers and I was quite good at it actually because I got such tiny hands, so I was, I was quite quick. But I, I'm glad that didn't last very long. I didn't realise, maybe everybody did all those years watching you. I guess I was that bit younger in your Premier League days. I didn't realise the Irish accent had survived this much. Ah, uh, well, it's because I'm talking to Irish people. My, my best mate, Alan Wiley, gives me no end of stick because um, I have to crank it down a bit with English people. And <laughs> it was quite ironic when my dad was alive, God bless him. Um, one of my friends said to me, why, why do you talk Irish to your dad and you talk English to us? And, and I went, I don't. Hmm. You know, I was thinking they meant Gaelic, you see. And they went, no, your accent changes. They said, well, you wouldn't understand me. Hmm. And they don't. If uh, I, When I first started on Sky TV, they were very, very conscious of certain words I couldn't pronounce. And I had to like watch the BBC News to try and... Um, words with T-H in it, I found very, very difficult, so I'd have to practice. I'd, I'd be dreading them say, was it a Thursday match or whatever, and they, they were trying to explain to me there was a H in the word Thursday, and it wasn't T-U-R-S. Mm. It was nice to hear you talk about refereeing there in a positive way, because we only ever talk about refereeing as a tough job, a lot of abuse, thankless task, all that kind of stuff, and then, you know, you talk to somebody like you, so 1990 through to 2007, you were on the pitch witnessing mm -hmm. some of the best players in the world and you had the greatest seat in the house for free mm -hmm. kicks, for some amazing first touches, for some amazing mm -hmm. passes. And, yeah. <laughs> and maybe we underappreciate that. I mean, is, who, was, who were your favourite players? Who took your breath away on a pitch? Um, loads of players. But I, I tell a story about uh, Zinedine Zidane. And I, I don't say that to name drop. It was just amazing. I, name, I refereed name, the dro name drop away here. No, no, no. I, I was... It was the Champions League semi-final. Um, you, you picture yourself, it's the Champions League sem semi-final, and Del Piero got the ball on the left wing. We were playing at the Del Alpi. I'd got the first leg of the game, which is obviously, you want the first leg because you don't want the second leg in case it's all over by then. But uh, Del Piero got the ball, and he smashed it across the pitch towards Zinedine Zidane. And as it went by me, it was about shoulder height, and it sounded like a tennis ball coming off the tee. It was going so fast. And Zinedine Zan put his foot out, and I thought, good luck with that. And he just cushioned it, brought it down, and knocked it off to Antonio Conte on the other wing. And I've just gone, wow. <laughs> I mean, this is in one of the biggest matches in the world. And he brought it down as if it was, you know, on the school playground. Yeah. You, I mean, you probably got even a deeper appreciation of how good these guys are. Oh, absolutely. And I think the reason you realise how good they are is because... One thing I had to do is train and train and train to get up to the speed they move. And when I played football, you know, I thought it was difficult to control a ball at certain times. You know, the ball had come to me fast and I'd have to lay it off fast. When, when I went into professional football, I mean, it was incredible. When, when I went back, um, what I used to do on a Saturday, if I refereed in the Premier League, I always used to referee in the Sunday League the next day in one of the villages near me. And the reason I did that was twofold. Firstly, it kept me very, very grounded. It didn't allow me to become a big time Charlie. It meant that I was very, very humble, like my dad brought me up to be. And the second thing was, it allowed me to almost do a recovery session because 
I'd go out on a Sunday morning and I'd be jogging about and the game was like slow motion compared to the day before. Mm. And it, that's the biggest thing is people don't realise um, the speed that these players are moving at, the speed the ball's moving at and the speed of thought that they have to move the ball on. Yeah, joy to be around. I guess I, I would presume the better players, it's easier to predict the flow of a Premier League game than a Sunday League game. I think, Joe, what I learned in refereeing was the higher you go, the easier it is to referee um, because you can judge the pattern. The players are more disciplined because they can't afford to lose uh, players. They can't afford suspensions. They can't afford to go down to 10 men. But what I would say, the higher you go, if a match is tough, it is really tough, much tougher than any other. You know, if a match really turns out tough, you have a really tough night. As in tough as in physical? Uh, all kinds of things, you know. Um, if a match turns sour, mm. uh, I refereed in the African Nations Cup, I refereed in Alexandria, Egypt, and Syria were playing the Ivory Coast. Syria needed to win, the Ivory Coast needed to draw to go through. We played 64 minutes, Syria winning 2-1. It wasn't really a problem because the Ivory Coast only needed a goal. And I give a penalty for a boy handling the ball on the line. So I had to send him off. And between minute 64 and minute 81, which is only 17 minutes, there was three red cards for the Ivory Coast and there were six yellow cards. Now, that anybody who checks my stats go, that's not me refereeing that game. Mm. But what they did, when they went 3-1 down, they completely lost their heads because they realised they had the competition. And it became one of the most difficult 20, oh, 17 minutes I've ever had in my life. Mm. What was Roy like to referee? It was great, actually, because he, he used to talk to me and um, knowing I was a, a Dublin boy, he'd, he'd give me a chance. But, you know, if he thought you made a mistake, he'd uh, he'd let you know it. But I, I would say I always got on well with him and evidence of that, you know, he would say, uh, you know, I booked him a few times, but he certainly deserved it. But I didn't ever have to even get close to telling me he was on a red card or even produce a red card. Mm. But I, I thought he was another player who was just driven by competitive edge, you know, fantastic. And, and a great guy to be around, you know. He, you know, you see him on the field, he just picks people up, doesn't he, and leads them. Mm. Could you sense his leadership if you were doing a United game and they were, you know, backs against the wall? I guess you're hearing what he's saying, you're hearing a lot of the conversations. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, he, he was. He was a great leader. I mean, evidence of that. I mean, you've only got to look back to Lansdowne Road when Ireland played um, Holland. You know, everybody talks about the McAteer goal, but they forget that Gary Kelly was sent off after 30 minutes and Roy Keane drove us through that match. You know, that, that next hour was one of the best performances you'd ever see from a footballer in, in view of how he played and how he, his leadership and whatever. Mm. And, you know, as well as McAteer saying, well, I scored a goal that got us to Japan, you know, Roy, Roy Keane just took that game on himself. What was the tradition, uh, Dermot, when you'd go into your referee's room? Like, could a knock on the door happen and Alex Ferguson would be there? Would things like that happen? Um, yeah, when I... It's, it's changed now, obviously, and it's changed a bit more because of the COVID, but when I was refereeing, um, we'll say a three o'clock game because it's easy to describe, you know, I'd, I'd turn up... I like to get to a ground as late as possible because I, I, I wasn't one for getting there at one o'clock because there's too much sitting about and too much just stewing time. So... I'd like to get there in an ideal world at quarter to two when the security briefing was on, but um, the drivers who took you wouldn't have that. You know, they'd always want to get you there by the latest half of one. I'd go in, lay my kit out, security come in, do that. Two o'clock, the managers would come in with the team sheets and the captains. Um, Alex Ferguson wasn't one to come in for Manchester United. You know, it was always Brian Kidd, uh, Tony Colton, I remember coming in. Um, others would come in. You didn't see him. So if a manager decided to send... Um, a representative that was it so and what what actually happened I mean people couldn't believe this you know to say what were the players like off the field well if I arrived at any ground at half one you know I, I'm preparing until two o'clock then much after two o'clock I'm changing stretching going out on the pitch at half two getting warmed up I come in after the game shower fill in the sheets on if there's any yellow cards red cards um, and then I'm gone you know, you don't really see anybody. You you go 
you arrive as a stranger and you leave as a stranger. So it was, pre it was pretty, pretty rare when you were having your post-match shower for someone to come barging in saying, Oi, Gallagher. <laughs> uh, I had one or two, there's no doubt about that, yeah, that was, because um, there's the 30 minute curfew, they, they can't come in okay. for 30 minutes, but, okay. um, you know, one or two of them said to me, well, set your watch, I'll be in, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I think the 30 minute curfew was brilliant, because I, I think, um, you know, if, if, if any manager comes barging in straight at, say, quarter to ten to five, there's a fair chance, Joe, he's not going to come in to tell me how well I've done. No. There's a, there's a fair chance he's going to come in to, you know, take out his anger on me. Well, I think that half hour, it's amazing what that does. Because that half hour, you know, it might not completely diffuse him, but it's going to take a lot of the real nasty anger out of him. Mm. So when he comes in, he's willing to have a conversation and he's willing to listen to your side. He might not agree with you, but he's willing to listen to your side rather than, um, you know, just... Bang, 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 you know, and, and just give you about barrels. Did you like to talk to players a lot during the game, even just even in open play? Only when I had to. Um, you know, um, I, I was quite willing to interact, but I didn't want to be, um, I just didn't want a run in commentary of games. So player by me, you know, I, I'd speak to them. Um, and I'd always try and speak to them by name as well, Joe. Was, it's how I was brought up in Ireland, uh, um, the biggest thing for me, as a boy was everybody called my dad Paddy, you know, and every parent of my friends, we called him by the name, <clears throat> excuse me. So it was a big thing, you know, names are precious. So, if, you know, if I could talk to a player, I'd always try and call him by name and, you know, just say, look, Joe, you know, be mindful, you know, you know, that I gave a foul, but the next time it might not be just a foul and, you know, just little things, little, just knocking about and, you know, I might say a few things, but I wouldn't interact for the sake of just trying to talk to a player because A, I've got to concentrate on my own game, and B, he doesn't really want it anyhow, does he? No. I guess, though, that's much better than going with the schoolmaster approach to talk to players on a level as opposed to, you know, get away from me and, you know, I'm the main man here. That wouldn't have suited me. No. Uh, it wouldn't have, yeah. See, the thing is, I learned in life. And I was very, very lucky, as I say, because my granny was a massive influence on me in my life. And she just taught me to be a good person. And the thing is, as a referee, you've got to be yourself. You can't be an actor. Mm. So it's no good trying to be Dermot Gallagher walking up and down the streets of Odica and some uh, dictatorial headmaster, if you like, on a football field, because it wouldn't suit me. And therefore, I wouldn't be able to concentrate and do my own role properly. So it's easier to be yourself. Dermot, who's the best referee in the Premier League today? Uh, I would think uh, there's two. Michael Oliver and Anthony Taylor, I think, are outstanding. And I really do. I think both of them um, will be vying to go to the Euros. I would like to think that uh, the UEFA will take both of them. If they only take one, I think they've got a very difficult decision to split them because we're about 22, 23 rounds into the Premier League. I've watched them week in, week out. They both perform very, very high level. They both make very, very few mistakes. They both, they both eliminate big mistakes, which is the key thing. But more importantly, they both go out week in, week out consistently. Mm. What was the toughest uh, afternoon in your career then? What was the one you got wrong that still irks you or that was oh. hard to take at the time? I know there have probably been hundreds. <laughs> Sorry, actually, I'm sure there haven't. I'm sure there haven't. <laughs> half a dozen, half a dozen the... tops. <laughs> Joe, Joe, there's someone at the door. I've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> Built me up and slaughtered me. Um, no, no it's, it's easy. It's easy. And I learned so much from it in... Um, I think it was about 2001, I refereed West Brom and Aston Villa. And uh, Mark Delaney, it was, it was just before half time. And Mark Delaney, um, he's heading into the area. And it's, it looks to me as though he's leaning forward. And straight away, I thought, he's going to hit the ground here. And I learned so much from this decision, honestly. And he did hit the ground, just as I thought. The only thing is, I didn't allow for Phil Gilchrist taking him off at the knee. And I gave it the biggest cut the grass ever. 
went goal kick and walked back. And Dion Dublin was stood next to me. I bump into Dion regular down at the studio now. And he often pulls my leg about this. And he just goes, you didn't fancy that, pal? <laughs> I, I said, do you think it was a penalty? He said, I did. He said, but you don't. He said, so there's no point in arguing. I'm like, oh, wow. Gareth Barry didn't quite see it like that because he <laughs> gave me dogs abuse. <laughs> so we're coming off at half time, and Gareth Barry's given me rah, 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 rah. and uh, Dion was going, "I'll oh, leave him alone, leave him alone." He didn't do it deliberate. So I've got in the dressing room at half time, and I said to the linesman, "Did you think that was a penalty?" He said, "It's the most blatant penalty I've ever seen in my life." <laughs> and I'm like, "Well, why didn't you help me out then?" Yeah. And he said, "Damn it," he said. When you give it the biggest cut of the grass I've ever seen in my life, he said, what can I possibly do to change your mind? Mm. And the things I learned there was, A, don't make a decision before it's happened, which I did, and B, don't close your options, which I did. But the upshot of the story was, and Dion will tell you this is not a joke, in the second half, every time something went to West Brom against Villa, Gareth Barry went to me, that's your fault, that's your fault, that's your fault. <laughs> and, what and about... About seven minutes to go, I gave Villa a penalty. And Dion said it was brilliant. He took it and he missed. And he was expecting a load of stick. And I turned to Gareth Barry and said, I suppose that's my fault as well, is it? <laughs> he went mad. What was your, uh, I mean, uh, modus operandi when a Gareth Barry was unleashing on you? Because they're, you know, it just goes with the job that players are emotional and they are going to come up and they're going to use bad language towards you and they're going to say, you know, how terrible you are and your disgrace and how maybe even you're a yeah. cheat as well who knows uh, we, what was your attitude towards what's the line here before I have to book you right um, no one ever called me a cheat no I can honestly say in 1200 plus pro matches no one ever called me a cheat mm. and I know that for a fact because I've never sent somebody off for calling me a cheat and I can tell you Joe I would it, if anybody called me a cheat, I'd send them off because, to me, you can call me incompetent, you know, you can criticise decisions, that's your prerogative and that's an opinion. But to call a referee a cheat is just totally devaluing his integrity and his credibility. Mm. And that, that, for me, is a step too far. I think when people talk to you on the field, it's a matter of, is it spiteful, is it nasty, is it malicious? And if anybody said something what I term as spiteful, nasty or malicious towards myself or my two assistants or another player, that's when I would red card. And I can honestly say I sent one player off for uh, being very, very nasty and spiteful to a linesman, as he was then. One player sent off for being very nasty and spiteful to an opponent. And I never had to send a player off for being nasty and spiteful to me. Right. To an opponent, really, did you? He, he, a lot, it was in a semi pro game a long time okay. ago. Okay. And he, he really did say something very nasty and spiteful. Do Premier League players get nasty and spiteful with each other? Um, they get spiky, they get feisty. Mm. But I think there's a big difference, isn't there? Because I think referees are well aware that um, in cricket they call it sledging, don't they? Yeah. That players will have a little pop. And I think both both players, you know, the player who's given it, the both players received it, will will see that as part of the game, and often they'll give it back later on. But when something becomes personal, spiteful, or malicious, as I say, mm. that's when you've got to say, well, you can't do that. You know, you've got to suffer the sanction.